We're going to take a moment to appreciate Andrew McCutcheon. We also uh, have three call-ups that we got to discuss. And then the vitalization, revitalization of some young guys that probably didn't need to be revitalized, but they're having really good starts. We want to talk about those really good starts. And then a certain rookie left-hander that is 30 years old is off to an incredible start, and we're going to dive into that. Jack, our I'm Just Baseball show, as always, it's presented by BetMGM. Today, Tuesday, April 16th, you're going, uh, no, the Rockies are in Philly right now, so you're not going to any Rockies games. No, no, no Rockies games. I'm I'm excited to try to get out to Rocktober at some point. Maybe I'll wait till, you know, the playoffs come around uh, so we can catch some some postseason madness out there in, in Denver. You know, you're probably good until like mid-October too. Just hit the CS, <laughs> hit the NLCS, and then uh, a couple games of the World Series, and we can, you know, have like a little pop-up activation in Denver for I, the World Series, and we'll be good. Sounds good to me. I, Nolan Jones at his first homer. Uh, I think things are starting to pick up a little bit. We'll see. But uh, no, it's it's a little bit of just a nice uh, nature stretch here this week. We'll be working in the mornings and early afternoon and then a couple hours ahead. So going to try to explore a bit out here in Colorado. You would absolutely hate being with me right now because I'm doing my best Tristan Casas impression. It's mm. 75 degrees in Indianapolis and I have a big grass patch like i don't live in a suburban area you've seen where i live i live in like yeah. a very urban area but there's like a big grass patch and i went like barefoot dug my toes in it was awesome and i You're felt earthing. the energy yeah i yeah. felt the energy from the core coming up and shooting into my core and it was great would you do that before every game also probably if yeah. it was nice outside if it was like 45 and rainy i wouldn't do it and i don't know if casas is doing it at that point but i think he's only doing it for the sunlight he, he wants the sunlight like he feels like it gives him energy which i think it like scientifically has proven that it does it's yeah. just it's just out there it's it's unique for sure awesome. like in in the underwear basically or like just in like shorts shirtless yeah. like it's it's wild uh but that guy doesn't give a shit which is i i respect it to a degree and then sometimes i'm like oh my gosh you're out there like did you see him doing like his pre-pitch uh, movements like you know like basically getting ready like one two down uh, like you're taught you know when you're playing infield in, in little league and of course every major leaguer does that because you have to be on your toes but he was DHing so he was out like off on the side doing that you know just to like stay locked in or whatever like he he teeters right and I love Casas he's been one of my favorite prospects yeah. and now he's obviously just a young big leaguer now and a, a great young big leaguer um, but he teeters right on the edge of eyewash but I think he does a good job of like just towing that line and then when you rake it doesn't matter and he's been heating up and I I can appreciate him calling out the Ted Williams seat as BS he said it's starting to no, feel I loved more that and, yeah it's, it's starting to feel more and more like a myth and he absolutely obliterated a ball, and it was still 70 feet shy of Ted Williams in right field. We need to acknowledge that, like, Mickey Mantle didn't hit a 670-foot homer, okay? That shit didn't happen. And I like Tristan Casas saying, yeah, it might have not happened, but you yeah. know what? They painted a seat red, so good for them. Yeah, I'm 6'4 and got all of that, and it legitimately have massive power, and I still was – you know, almost a hundred feet short probably didn't happen. I love that. It's like after that is where he's like, yeah, there's no way. There's if no I, way. That, I, I got all of that one, there's no freaking way. And I can appreciate him getting his feet wet in the big leagues before he says that, because yes. if he said that as a rookie, like, oh, I didn't even come close in batting practice. Then we've got an issue, but I think it's okay now. Um, yeah. I do want to appreciate Andrew McCutcheon for a little bit before we really get into this, because Andrew McCutcheon in Philly, so former employer with his, uh, best in long time employer, the Pittsburgh Pirates, hit his 300th career home run. And I just mm -hmm. want to run you through the numbers. And this guy's not getting into the Hall of Fame. I wonder if he'll get his number retired in Pittsburgh. I think that's the better conversation. Mm -hmm. Andrew McCutcheon, the career accolades, five time All Star, four time Silver Slugger. He won a gold glove. He was the 2013 National League MVP. He had four consecutive top five MVP yeah. finishes from 2012 to 2015. So this guy was one of the best players in all of baseball during a stretch in the 2010s. He's a career 275 hitter with an 834 OPS. He's got over 2,000 hits, just hit 300 home runs. He's got over 1,000 career RBIs. He's got over 200 career stolen bases. And he's got a career war of 48.5, which is ninth among active hitters. Quick pause for trivia. Who are the eight above him? 
So it, it, above him in in, oh, in what'd you say? Career war. war. Active players ahead of him in war. Active hitters. There are a bunch active. of pitchers like Kershaw, Scherzer, Verlander. They're all ahead, but I did hitters. Active hitters ahead of him in war. Um, you got to probably already have Mookie Betts on there. Mookie. Uh, Freddie Freeman. Freddie. There's going to be some obvious guys that I'll just miss, and I'll be really pissed off about it. Uh, Marcus Semien? No. No. Damn, he's not there yet? Nope. So not one there. guy is 20 war ahead of Mookie. Mookie is second. This other guy is 20 ahead of him. I'm just searching like old heads in my in my nope. brain. Like, Don't do that. Don't do that? Don't do that. Don't do the old heads. For number one, don't do the old head. Wow. Okay. I mean, Mike Trout, of course. Trout's and then, 86 career war already. Yeah. I mean, that's that's disgusting. He's going to get over 100. Especially, I mean, yeah. dude, he's, he's, he, he might have another, <laughs> my, I mean, like prayers up, knock on yeah, wood, yeah, yeah. everything. Like if he has another Mike Trout season, like I, I, I'll get to the point now, if he has another Mike Trout season, I'm not even going to say like, please get him away from the Angels. I'm just going to shut the fuck up and just enjoy it. Yeah. Um, because I, everyone knows, everyone agrees. Let's get him away from the Angels. It's like, there's a lot of things that we're like, oh, like let's let's end this or that, and we just can't. I feel like it's in that it's in that area now. Yeah. Let's just enjoy it. Uh, but back on the topic. So how many more do we have here? So you've got three. You've got Trout, Mookie, and Freddie. Um, two guys in the National League Central. Altuve. Altuve, good. Okay, so two guys in the NL Central. Yeah. NL Central. Yelich. Nope. Man. Same team in the NL Central. Same team in the NL Central. They Brewers. get more into the old head type thing. Brewers player, old head? Nope. Wait, oh, oh, you said, I thought you said same team in the NL Central. Yeah, same team in the NL Central. Like, they're on the same team, but they're not Brewers. Oh, I thought you meant same team as the Brewers. I'm like, what, no. wait, wait, who the hell is it if it's not Christian Yelich? No. Um, they're on the same team in the NL Central. Ah, this is this is good trivia, man. Like, this is the stuff that, like, I get pissed because it should be easier, and then yeah. just I can't search it in my brain. Uh, I'm assuming the Cardinals, Goldschmidt, and... Yes. Arenado. Yes. Okay. You got two more. Old head just signed a minor league deal in his hometown. Old head just signed him. Uh, Joey Votto. Votto. And then one more. NL West. Kind of shocking that this guy has more career war than McCutcheon. <laughs> I mean, Charlie Blackman? Nope. Nah, I did just say, did it just, no, this, this guy's like fully on a decimates Hall of Fame your, track. So what would you say? This guy's fully on a Hall of Fame track. Like young so, 30s young 30s on a, oh manny machado machado yeah so it was funny i was watching the game yesterday by the way manny machado home run swing just just so beautiful, beautiful. um he crushed that ball he's one looking like he's kind of back to himself hitting wise and two he's already throwing you know and looks like he can be back at third base pretty soon which i think the padres would welcome that with open arms considering you know they rushed to grand Pauly up there and now they've got tyler wade out there <laughs> Uh, but I was thinking about it when I was watching him and I was like, that's a baseball card. I think I want to pick up a few more of just because like, he's pretty much a shoe in to get into the hall. At um, it, like, it's, like unless he, unless he legitimately falls off a cliff. And I feel like if he comes back from this little elbow thing and he continues to be Manny Machado, um, his track is pretty crazy uh, mm -hmm. from a war and just like the basic accumulation statistical standpoint. Uh, mm -hmm. Pretty, pretty crazy. Nuts. Um, so those are the eight guys ahead of Andrew McCutcheon. I'll leave the floor to you on, on McCutcheon appreciation, just qualitatively. Cause I just gave you all the quantitative stuff, but this guy, like, again, he's not going to be a hall of famer. I don't even know if he's like on the hall of very good track. I just think he's a damn good player, but he's going to go down in pirates lore. And I do think that they're going to end up retiring his number. I would throw him in the hall of very good. I, I, I like, just because I think, you, you know, when you exceed the 2000 hits, you exceed the 300 homers, you have the MVP, you have two other top three finishes. Yeah, It would have been nice to see his peak be longer, but that peak was, was pretty awesome. And in a time where like offense was, was just a little bit frustrating. Yeah. Uh, and I know like it's been frustrating in recent years too, but I felt like this stretch kind of 2012, 2015, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but he led the, the league in like with a 950 OPS uh, that year that he finished in third after winning the MVP, but that yeah. four year stretch there 
I mean, it's it's pretty hard to to deny what he was doing. He also just has a great story coming from extremely humble beginnings. That picture that we've seen, you know, of of his house that he grew up in, mm-hmm. that is about like five feet by five feet. Like it, it is it is a shack, and he like owns it, and it's really amazing. Just that when you see how far somebody's come in that regard. But the four year stretch where he hit 313, 404, 523, 100 home runs over that span. I mean, that's as good as they come. I'm curious what, you know, what he, I, I don't know, I guess what the numbers were like then, because I do feel like he doesn't have that like off the charts OPS stretch, again, leading the league with a 952, won the MVP with a 911. Um, but I'm curious, like comp- compared to his peers those years, how it would look because uh, I, I feel like his peak kind of came at a time where uh, it may not jump out as much when we look back on it. Right. So seven year peak, like you have the jaws score, right? Seven year peak was, was 38.4 career war for him. Um, average for a hall of famer is about 45 career war. So he is shy of the average hall of famer, but problem was it wasn't really a seven year peak. It was a four year peak. Mm-hmm. And in that stretch, he put up wars of, 6.9, 7.8, 6.4, 5.0. So I, I am curious, like if you were to look as a whole at those years, where does he stand? Like his 7.8 yeah. war led the National League, but he didn't lead it a 6.9. He didn't lead it a 6.4. He didn't lead it a 5.0. What he did for the Pittsburgh Pirates during that stretch was... I mean, as as MVP as it got, and he yep. willed the Pittsburgh Pirates to the wild card. Like yep. 2013, I remember that year. It was it was Arietta versus Garrett Cole in 2013, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, might have been 2014. But I mean, they had the NL Central had three I think 95 plus win teams. Yeah, and you had the big bad. Chicago Cubs, and you had the big bad St. Louis Cardinals. I think, and then. It was the Pirates, <laughs> and the Pirates had had a young stud pitcher, sure, and they had guys that were tooled out like Gregory Polanco and Starling Marte, but it was McCutcheon. McCutcheon yeah. was the guy that dragged them to the wild card series, and I, yeah. I just thought that was amazing. No, and one other note, you know, and even the Brewers were good through that those stretches too. Like they they were they were a tough team, but looking at the the OPS numbers, so 2013 the league average OPS was 714. And in 2014, the league average OPS was 700. Just for reference, like when we were looking at 2022, where people were like, what is going on? You know, offense is so, so poor right now. That was a 706 OPS last year. It was up to 734 league wide. Uh, So it's, it's gotten back up there, but you know, there was a stretch there where that's as low as we've seen it really, I think at all since 2000, you look at 2022 and then it's coincidentally the stretch of, of McCutcheon really dominating and it, that's why he was doing it in a time when no one else was really doing it so 700 league wide ops in in 2014 714 league wide ops in 2013 and a 724 which is kind of back on to closer to what we've become accustomed to but still i'd say lower than the average by a good margin over the last 20 years uh back in 2012 so again he he had his peak when offense as a whole was as low as we've seen it in, the, in this century uh, and I think that also says a lot about him. Uh, unfortunately, just kind of slowed down once he hit that age 29, age 30 stretch. But it's been nice to see him kind of elongate his career here and still be a a piece for several different teams over the years and, and extend that career and uh, kind of hit some of those important thresholds. I, definitely a Hall of Very good guy for me, but also just a guy that was always a blast to watch. I think really good for the game and the the thing that I remember the most kind of in that 2012 to 2015 range was you know, just being a Marlins fan, going to the games when I was in high school. When he was up, he put that same level of fear in me of like what he's about to do to my favorite team that all of the other superstars I watched. And like, that's the qualitative, like you can't really put it into to numbers or anything like that. But I have a vivid memory of just sitting there watching McCutcheon up at the plate and being like, oh shit, like here we go. And there's only a few guys that would give me that feeling when I'd go to Marlins games, you know, the, over those years. Yeah. Uh, he also is like the best adopted Pittsburgher that they have. And the fact that you saw the best of McCutcheon and the best of Sidney Crosby at the same time, Pittsburgh is like a very fortunate town to that, to have like those yeah. two that have 
fully embraced Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania as their place. Yeah, they're still there right now. They're still there right now. If McCutcheon came back, he's like made Pittsburgh his his home pretty much. And Sidney Crosby, like, dude, he's still kicking. Ovechkin's still kicking. I'm not a hockey guy, but those guys. Yeah, I'm not. I, I ask, and I've I've been told that Crosby's still nasty. So that's crazy. That's crazy. That's crazy. Absolutely- like he's got to be approaching like obviously not Gretzky, but like he's got to be approaching you know top fifteen twenty player in in NHL history at that point. If he's I'd assume, still nasty, I'd assume hockey heads. Let us know in the comments where yeah. uh, Sidney Crosby stacks up all time because yeah, I have no heads. idea. I I know it's I know it's up there. What you got, puckheads? Um, all right, we've got a couple of call ups that I want to go through before we really get into Michael Bush, MJ Melendez, and Shota Imanaga. Jonathan Classe got the call from the Seattle Mariners. Nick mm-hmm. Nestrini got the call from the Chicago White Sox and Mitchell Parker, a left-hander got the call from the Washington nationals. I want to start with the one hitter class say Jonathan class a stole 79 bases last year between high a and double a majority of the year was spent in double a. He was, would you consider him a pop-up prospect last year or was it, Hey, keep an eye on this guy. And then he really showed out in the early goings. Very close to a pop-up because he really like heated up, I think at the end of 22. And I think that's where it really started to like become a thing. And people are like, oh, okay, let's watch out for class A. But at the same time, it wasn't like he was on everybody's radar. It was just a, a absolutely torrid finish to 2022. And then just carried that into an insane start to 2023. Yeah. So class A between high A and double A had 20 homers and 79 bags. He doesn't turn 22 until the end of May this year. So this is a young guy that they're calling up. And in his first 12 games at the AAA level, he got assigned to AAA to open the year. He was slashing 311, 396, 622 with eight extra base hits with Tacoma. Tacoma is a hitter-friendly environment, sure. Mm -hmm. But this is a 21-year-old that was standing on his head. And the Mariners need a shot in the ass right now. I think they're hoping that he's the shot in the ass. Yeah, you know, I- I'm interested to see how it all looks over the course of the entire season. But you mentioned kind of like the shot in the ass. This guy can come up and, and electrify your lineup and-, and have one of those stretches where it's like, whoa, and everyone gets too hyped on him. And then he slows down a little bit as pitchers adjust and then people get too low on them. But I think they need that guy that it can just come in and and jolt them. That said, small sample, but in the early going of this season in AAA, Classe does look like he was made aware of some of the shortcomings last year, which it was still a great year, but he, he fell off a bit in double A. Uh, the, the thing that was a blue zone for him was the elevated fastballs. He's an extremely lofty borderline uppercut swing, which is why he's able to hit a lot of home runs for a guy that produces average exit velocities. But that swing started to get so lofty and uphill that you know, you get to double A, you're facing the Tulsa Drillers, the Dodgers double A, you're facing a lot. I mean, the Rangers, a lot of these different teams in that Texas league had pitchers who were just disgusting, but specifically high riding fastballs. And that started to chew him up a little bit. Um, And he started to expand a little bit more too. In the early going this year, it seems like his swings a little bit flatter. He's still going to be a guy that's selling out for lift. Don't get me wrong, but it just seems like a slight adjustment to that. And then the approach he was very aggressive. He's been a little bit less aggressive this year. It seems like he's just tweaked some of those things that were holding him back last year. That said, there has been some good batted ball luck. Uh, I, I think that he, he's probably not the guy that we've seen through the first 12 games, but you're getting elite speed, a great base dealer, a guy that can play a good center field, a switch hitter, um, and and a guy that can just really be a spark for you. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he hits the ground running at all, but I also wouldn't be surprised if – you know, he's overmatched because there is still some rawness to his game. Uh, but I think with what we've seen so far, he's definitely headed in the right direction and should be a fun challenge. So can I just say that I never expected the Seattle Mariners to need a shot in the ass in center field again? Yeah. I thought that this guy that man center for them every day was going to be a mainstay for 15, 20 years. And I'm not concerned but what the hell is wrong with Julio Rodriguez right now? Yeah, I, I can't figure it out. But like the numbers are horrible. 16 games, he's 11 for 59. So he's hitting a buck 86. He has one extra base hit in 63 plate appearances. He's punched out 21 times. He's walked three. I don't know what's happening with him. And it could be like, hey, Julio, take two, three days off and just like, get the cage or sleep for 12 hours a night, whatever you got to do. And class A will hold it down. And then you come back and, you know, it's, it's all you again. Like we expect you to be the Julio of old, 
or it's, hey, Julio, go go hop in a corner for a day. Class A can play center, or it's Class A hop in a corner. Like, it just it feels like they're trying to hedge what's going on with Julio right now. I think it's probably, you know, most likely just him hop in a corner being, you know, him being Class A for the most yeah. part. Like, I think he's going to go up there and, and mostly play right. And then they've been having Mitch Hanniger, or excuse me, Mitch Garver get reps at first. So then Garver maybe f- fills in at first a bit more. Hanniger slides into the DH role. Uh, I think that's what makes the most sense. But then also having somebody, though, as you mentioned, that you can plug into center field to give that day off to Julio when he needs it. Because right now, like, he, as he, you mentioned, when he's struck, he, there's no one else that can really plug in there. And, and and you know, you wouldn't feel like you're you're giving up a ton defensively and potentially offensively, even with Julio struggling. So I do feel like there's a level of, hey, we're bringing somebody else up that, you know, can give Julio the day off here or there, you know, especially if he continues to struggle. But two, uh, I think it gives them the opportunity to, to have some better outfield defense all around. I mean, Hanniger, I think he's, look, he's, he's looked as healthy as, as he has in a while, but at the end of the day, like, it's going to be a much better defensive situation with uh, with Class A out there. I think Hanniger's already graded out as negative three outs above average. So having someone that can plug in here and there when you need a little bit of time, um, you know, for for Julio, which I don't think is going to be something that happens very often at all, but it is just nice to have. On top of the fact that you can improve the defense a bit, I think he does help a ton uh, just from mixing and matching and also just having speed at the top. Julio just seems like he's in his head a little bit too, right? Getting picked mm-hmm. off for the last out of that last game. Um, as you know, we're recording this, it was yesterday, but as people are listening, it'll be two days ago. Like it's just it just seems like he's a little bit out of whack. Remember, he started really poorly last year, too. Yeah. And if it weren't for a, a little bit of a last gasp and then uh, you know, some home cooking, he, he wouldn't have been an all-star. Uh, I was happy he was because you know that's what the all-star game's all about. But you know, it, there's definitely been some volatility, you know, the last the last year and a half. And he was a guy that I thought, like, okay, he's gonna take those lumps last year, uh, ride that that nice stretch that he finished the season with and you know, be an MVP candidate this year. And I still think he can, but right now it just it just doesn't look great. And if you look at their roster, there's nobody else that could have really plugged into center. No, um, I mean Rayleigh started a game in center, but Luke like Rayleigh's that's been, crazy. But and and Rayleigh's been miserable offensively, and I'm yeah. not ready to call it a Rays fleece yet. But Caballero is kicking ass in Tampa, and, and Rayleigh is three for twenty three with no walks to open up his his well, Mariners he, tenure. He stunk in the second half of last year too, so it's kind of a trend, um, and it, that that is a little bit more concerning. But to that point, man, like Canzone can't play center, so they literally don't have anybody else that can play center. So yeah, I think just to even be able to give Julio an off day when you want to is huge, but I think you're also getting a, a, a defensive upgrade and hopefully a little bit more speed. Cause you'll get this lineup. There's not a ton of speed in it outside of Julio. Yeah. Uh, another guy, we've got two more uh, call-ups that I want to go over. Nick Nestrini with the Chicago White Sox. He got, you know, hit hard by Norfolk. Everybody got hit hard by yeah. Norfolk. He bounced back a bit against Jacksonville. I'm not sure if you caught any of that. Nestrini in Jacksonville uh, punched out eight, walked one. I think he did allow three runs, um, mm-hmm. but Nestrini two earned. In, two earned. It, it, Nestrini in two starts with Charlotte, seven innings, 12 hits, six earned, but he struck out 13 and walked three. Nestrini was acquired alongside Leisure in the Lance Lynn, Joe Kelly deal. That looks like a good deal for the White Sox because Leisure is a bullpen guy. Nestrini, I know that there are some concerns with him, but he seems like a five. And this isn't, you know, I remember going to Michael Kopech's MLB debut and everybody was so fired up for Kopech. This is not going to hit like a Kopech debut or a Cease <laughs> no. debut. Like, But this shouldn't feel like Davis Martin. This shouldn't feel no. like, who is that? Nestrini is absolutely somewhere in between. And I think that this guy can be a decent five starter in major league baseball for a long time. I think there's room for a little bit more too, right? You could be a, a, a solid four if, if the command keeps you know ticking forward and uh, that feel for the change up is there. But I mean, the slider is disgusting. That's a big league pitch. And that's the other thing is you look at the trade. I think you're hundred percent right. Cause even if Nestrini ends up being a reliever, he could be a really good reliever as well. And you got two high leverage arms and potentially one of them being a closer uh, in a deal for Lance Lynn. So I think no matter what happens with Nestrini, uh, you got to feel good about that trade. And, and that's a, you know, uh, we haven't been able to say that about the White Sox in a little bit. So I, I think there's a lot of hope that he can stick in the rotation with the way that he commands the slider with, with the fastball, you know, being good enough. Uh, but, you know, I do think that there's a question of, okay, where's the change of in curveball going to be? 
let's see in the big leagues at this point, like the guys that they're rolling out there right now, I think you could argue are, well, you're, they're definitely less talented, a little bit more polished than Nestrini, yeah. but I, I'd rather just see what Nestrini can do up there and let him learn at the big league level and, and not waste any more bullets in AAA and kind of riding, like you said, a better star to bounce back. It's really hard to fault him against Norfolk. Uh, I, I thought that what you saw against Jacksonville is kind of what you can expect. Like he's going to, give up a few runs here and there. There might be, I think he's a little susceptible to the long ball, but he's going to strike out a lot of hitters. And when he's on, he's on, like he can, he can surprise you and look more like that three that just, there's going to be days where he looks like a guy that maybe needs to be in the bullpen. So there's a wider range, but like, let's see him work through that at the big league level. There's no reason for him to be in triple a, you shouldn't have a triple a staff that could soon be more talented than your big league staff, which is what would happen with the white Sox If they kept Nostrini down and then Thorpe gets up, who's been great out of the gate, by the way. Um, and, and Iriarte gets up there as well. Like you could argue that that triple a rotation is more exciting. Uh, so I'm glad they're doing this. A hundred percent. I'm glad as well. Another guy that I'm actually fairly confident in can be a five starter at the major league level is Mitchell Parker with the Washington nationals. And he is better than what they have been running out at this point. Mitchell Parker, big left-hander is going to make his major league debut facing off against Tyler glass. Now in the LA Dodgers in LA, he might get bludgeoned in his major league debut, but do not be concerned. Mitchell Parker made a start with Rochester this year. He went four innings, one hit, one unearned run, struck out five and walked one. He is a big dude, 24 years old. He's like 6'4", 240, I want to say. But you hear 6'4", 240, and you think, okay, I'm going to bully, get down on the mound. I'm at a low three quarters. You know, I'm just going to rip it. Mitchell Parker is a very unorthodox thrower where he's a big guy that works very vertical, and he is almost directly over the top. And he's super uncomfortable for opposing hitters. And that, I think, is like the key word with him. He'll snap off a curveball off of a fastball that plays well top of the zone. He added a splitter, I think, at the end of last year, too. Um, He is a north-south guy. Are really good hitters, like the L.A. Dodgers' first five, going to kill him? Maybe. But I think this guy, over the course of 20 starts at the major league level, you know, you're going to look at the numbers, you can watch him sporadically, and say, like, you know what? This is a better option than three of the guys they were running out on opening day. The Nationals need... uh... They just need Mitchell Parkers. You're going to have high upside arms, hopefully that you continue to add to the fold, but you need guys that you can put you know, pencil into the four or five slot and, and feel good that they're not going to get blown up. And I don't think Mitchell Parker is going to get blown up over the course of an entire season. I feel pretty good about him being, like you said, just that solid back end of the rotation arm, eat innings, fill up the zone for the most part and, and miss enough bats. Uh, I think the command was something to kind of watch. Uh, yeah. I think you know, the triple A zone may have been part of it. And he got better and better as, as the season progressed in terms of cutting down the walk rate and really settled in down the stretch. But he's kind of one of those guys that you mentioned. It looks like a normal release, but before he gets there, like yeah. it, he hides the ball really well. He almost shows it to you behind his back. And then it's, it's that slingshot type where you know, the arm is almost the last thing you see as the body's coming forward, gets a little bit more than average extension. I, I think this is all going to play. I feel like Mitchell Parker is going to be a piece in that rotation for the foreseeable future and and give them just some continuity because, you know, they're exciting arms like a Cade Cavalli and a Cole Henry have just been hurt and, and up and down and have command issues. And then, you know, Josiah Gray, you don't even know what to think. And unfortunately is hurt now. Mackenzie Gore has settled in now as more of that like safer back end guy, but you're, you're still hoping for more out of him. So it's just nice to kind of pencil somebody in here that you feel good about being able to just go out there be a low four ZRA guy, potentially eat innings and give you a chance every fifth day, especially as this team starts to bring in the offensive reinforcements. They're going to rake soon. In the next year or two, that team's going to rake. So just filling out the rotation with able bodies is, is good. And Parker's not a guy that I think is going to go up and down. I think he's better than that. Um, but I think that's the important distinction. There's five starters that go up and down. I think he's closer to that fringe four that sticks there. I'm, I'm totally with you. Uh, another one, good question posed by uh, Christian Crespo via text. Who, he's doing a great job on the prospect front for us at JustBaseball.com. Just put out the second uh, minor league hitter and pitcher of the week article. That's a good weekly thing that we got going every Monday. Christian's going to be putting it out, but um, he, he sent a text. Over under 11 and a half ABs for Canario before he gets sent back down. Alexander Canario was recalled by the Cubs. Different manager, I go over. I think Craig Council might make it a point to get him in the lineup. And we were pissed last year because Canario was raking in AAA. 
he gets up. We think, all right, you know what? This is going to be a great September call up. He's going to, you know, be an influx of, of sporadic power and he can hold his own in a corner. He didn't play. <laughs> and no. like, it was so frustrating. It I was, think he's going to play now. It was silly. And that was kind of a Ross thing. Um, I mean, we, we, we even saw it. Like I felt like Mervis never even got a fair shot because never he, he would just never play two games in a row. And I know he didn't look great, but there was a lot of underlying data that looked pretty good. And then you're like, Oh, like get him back out there. And then he just, you know, again, it was kind of the Ross thing where he liked to stick with his guys and I get it. Uh, but if you're going to bring a guy up, you got to, you got to give him a run. And I think Canario is going to get some run. I think he's going to be that, that, maybe lefty masher for them and can plug in play there. Um, he can really run into baseballs and to have that guy off your bench is great. And it's fine. Have him come off the bench, but come off the bench, not just sit there. So, you know, if he can start once or twice a week and then, you know, get on enough pinch hit opportunities, I think you can justify having him up there. Uh, but I, I feel like it's a, he's probably a little bit better than that role. Yeah. And it's kind of like the Nelson Velasquez thing where he ends up going to Kansas city and he looks really good right yeah, now. Awesome. Uh, but, you know, you don't want to just give away a Canario because he's more talented than Velasquez. Right. So I, I think this is a role that he can thrive in. But again, you, you, you don't want to just limit him so much that he's getting you know, 10 at-bats a week. He's got to be getting more than that. I'm totally with you. All right. We are going to get into a guy that was not given ample run and current teammate in Nelson Velasquez. But before that, I want to tell you a teensy bit about Game Time. Game Time is a new sponsor that we've got going on. And it's great because like, I've actually been a fan of game time for a while. It's fun when places that you're a fan of for a long time, like latch on to the show. So yes. I just want to tell you a little bit more about them. We've all found ourselves in a situation somewhat similar to this, right? You see there's a great pitching matchup that you're willing to drive like an hour or two for, or a concert that popped up out of nowhere. You in New York, you probably deal with that all the time. It's all like the time. Thursday night, we've got a concert. Like I would love to go to this, but then you go scanning for tickets roadblocks everywhere no good deals nothing at the last minute list goes on and then like you're hit with the barrage of fees it's crazy let's fix that for you new friend of the show is game time game time is now an authorized ticket sell ticket marketplace of major league baseball which makes getting tickets even faster and easier prices on the game time app actually go down the closer mm -hmm. it gets to first pitch you got killer last minute deals all in prices is my favorite thing you get views from your seat the lowest price guarantee. Game time takes the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets. I've had a great time with it personally. Um, I'm excited to have a great time with it this summer. We get a rain out. The Indiana Fever, Caitlin Clark are in town. I'm going to pop into the app. I'm going to choose a seat. I'm going to see the vantage point. I'm going to grab the ticket within 60 seconds. Again, mentioned it with Peter. Maggie Rogers is coming to town beginning of June. I'm going to get my concert tickets on game time. Maybe Bryson Tiller at the end of June. We'll see if Ooh. we get a rain out that day. That would be awesome. Um, I don't know. I can even get minor league tickets. You can go to Brooklyn Cyclones games. You can yep. go to Somerset Patriots games using the game time app. Use game time for last minute deals. Save up to 60% off buying last minute for sports, concerts, comedy, theater. List goes on. Yes, you get a lowest price guarantee and panoramic seat views. Again, I love the all-in pricing. I use this toggle feature at the beginning so you know what you're getting into without like getting to check out and saying, holy smokes, like what is a convenience fee? I just know what I'm yeah. paying up front. No BS. It's phenomenal. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Here's what you got to do. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use code just baseball, all caps, no spaces for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account. Redeem code just baseball for twenty dollars off. Game uh, download the game time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. One it last thing to add on that: I used game time to go to I I believe it was it either was the last start of Degrom's with the Mets or what was believed to possibly be his last start with the Mets at home, and I wanted to go. I just because I wanted to be able to check that off, but the tickets were way too much. And so I was like, I'm just going to keep refreshing game time, refreshing game time. They have these flash deals that'll pop up. And so I swiped the flash deal. I was like, oh, man, I might have to pull the trigger on these. They were like sixth row down the first baseline. Uh, I brought my girlfriend. We literally gave her 10 minutes notice. I'm like, can you get on a train in 20 minutes? Let's let's go run to the game. We bought the tickets went, and I'm so glad it was electrifying. The Mets fans were absolutely like locked in it was a really cool environment and i literally had people around me so they were talking about how much they paid for the seats and i was like 
I didn't want to tell them what I, what I paid. I was like, I, I might've got away with one here, but uh, definitely a big fan of the app and it helps us out. If you use our promo code and you get the $20 off. So might as well use it. hundred percent. We're linked up in the episode description as well. So go ahead and uh, pull the trigger on game time. Michael Bush pulling the trigger a lot and he is hitting a bunch of bombs last year with the LA Dodgers in 27 games. Michael Bush hit a buck 67 with a 539 OPS. He had five extra base hits and a K rate at 33%. This year, in his first 15 games with the Cubs, he's slashing 327, 393, 694. It's a 1087 OPS. That's more than double his OPS and almost double the sample with the Dodgers last year. He's got eight extra base hits already, and the K rate's down to 25% in the early goings. We were texting about him before we hopped on to record the show. My theory is very simple. I and like I know you agree. He's just stress free at this point. Yes. He knows that nobody's taking a B's away from him. And I'm watching Michael Bush thrive. And I'm like, Miguel Vargas should be kicking holes in the wall right now because he's dealing with the same shit. Yeah. Bush didn't get ample runway in LA. He's getting it in Chicago. And he wasn't bad. This is what he's always done when he's gotten yeah. consistent playing time. You go to his baseball reference page, look at the minor league stats for him. Anywhere he's been for more than like 20 games, he's raked because he yeah. knows he's getting ABs every day. He knows yeah. he's getting ABs every day in Chicago and he is running with the opportunity. I mean, I, I, like we're going to talk about like nitty gritty, like swing adjustments with uh, MJ Melendez. I, I don't think there's anything to dive into beyond the mental, like you just said. I mean, Bush is hit at every stop. Every time he goes back to AAA, he absolutely mashes. But this wasn't one of those like, oh, no, it's a quadruple A type of guy situation. It wasn't at all. And and you can tell that the Dodgers still felt that way, too, because the return that the Dodgers got, like not just like because of the way that Zaire Hope is playing now, even at the time, that was a lot to give up for an older player who has been trying to find, you know, relatively speaking as a prospect, mm -hmm. you know, trying to find his footing at the big league level. We knew that he could and, and knew that he was talented, but not a you know, doesn't have a defined position, was going to be traded for to play first. The Cubs gave up really good pieces in Jackson Ferris, who's a really good left handed pitching prospect, and then Zaire Hope, who's probably going to be a top 100 guy by sometime this season. And I mean, the Cubs maybe didn't think he'd come out of the gate this hot, but the Cubs knew that they had something special with Zaire Hope as well in terms of what he can do physically. So they knew they were giving up a lot, but they also knew what they were getting in Michael Bush. And that's why I think this is going to be a, a classic win-win trade here, but they gave up plenty to get him. And I think when you look at that stretch of like, it was like 12 games was like the largest MLB stretch. I think he had last year. Did he have another one earlier in the season that was more sizable than that? Or was it that so? Yeah, no, so that 12-game stretch in the end of August to early September, yeah, it wasn't great. He was three for 27. Did have two home runs, though. Two of his three hits were home runs. <laughs> like, how do you not press when you know that unless you perform extremely well, the second the team gets a little bit healthier, you're going back to AAA? You don't even get a chance with, with 12 games, you know, to, to really settle in at all. He also was playing first and third and then would DH some games. It was a little bit of a, a, a weird situation for him, and he faced a lot of good arms in that stretch. So I, I really think for him it's just a matter of being, like you said, free and and just knowing that if he goes 0 for 4 or if he has a bad week, this team invested a lot to go get him, and they're fully set on him being their guy. And I think that's got to be – motivating and freeing for him and also just continuously playing first and just not having to worry about third or second or whatever has got to be helpful as well. A hundred percent. I don't know what the Dodgers are doing. Chris Taylor has been so hard to watch. He's striking yeah. out, I think over 50% of the time. Miguel Vargas is playing left field full time in Oklahoma city. He's OPSing over a thousand. Andy Pajes is splitting his time between center and right. He's OPSing over 1100. If I'm Pajes, if I'm Vargas, and Pajes might be in a different boat because he's so young, but Vargas has, like, gotten up, needed to press. He was only up because Lux wasn't healthy. Like, it, it feels like there's constantly a pinch, and they've got a 28-man roster that they just try and finagle into 26, and then you have two understudies waiting in Oklahoma City. Bush was the understudy. He's elsewhere. He's thriving because he feels like he's part of a team identity. If I'm yeah. Vargas, I'm looking at Bush and, and I'm saying, like, I want that so freaking bad. And if it yeah. happens for the entire year and Andy Pajes spends 150 games in Oklahoma City, I go into this offseason if I'm Andy Pajes and I'm saying, 
I'm looking at Michael Bush and thinking, I want that so freaking bad. Yeah. And, and Vargas is still only 24 and I dealt with so many injuries last year. And I think kind of eliminated a lot of the helium for him. And then, you know, mm-hmm. Pajes further off, but was just getting up to triple A at the end of last or at the beginning of last year and looked great and has put up good numbers at most stops and then had that shoulder issue. So both those guys, you know, kind of lost that momentum last year, but I think both now being so good out of the gate and, and I think both being able to offer a, a lot to this Dodgers team, I think they're going to get close to probably deciding to to bring up. I think Vargas probably makes the most sense because he's a little bit more versatile, especially if you're subbing out for Chris Taylor. He's not going to be able to play center and fill in, you know, a shortstop like Chris Taylor. But the right. fact that he could play left and third and second, you know, and first and, you know, kind of move around the diamond is, is helpful. Uh, I, I feel like Vargas has got to be knocking on the door pretty soon here. Well, and I think Taylor at this point this year has really only played a corner outfield. He's got 11 starts in left and he's got – yeah, he he hasn't played anything except left field at this point. So you've got Chris Taylor sucking the way he is right now, and you've got Miguel Vargas raking the way he is right now, and they're playing the same position a level apart. I mean, what are we doing here? Like, it, it's just crazy. Man. They're paying Chris Taylor. <laughs> and I that's, mean, God. And it's crazy because I actually, like, I, I would have given him that deal in a heartbeat. I know you wanted Miami to give him the deal. I wanted the Marlins too. It might have been a little bit of the the postseason, you know, lore that you just get so excited about big swings in the postseason. But honestly, you just looked at the versatility, the speed, everything that he had been doing, and the age. I mean, like it's not like he's forty; he's thirty three. But it just looks like he's slowed down, man. Like he just doesn't look like the same guy. And they owe him thirteen million this year. They owe him thirteen million next year, and they have a club option in twenty six for twelve million that. You know, I'm sure that they will, unless something changes drastically, uh, will will decline. But I mean, that's 26 million that they owe him over the next two years. He's going to get every single opportunity to try to right the ship here, and yeah, uh, it stinks for the guys in AAA. But I, I imagine that there's probably going to be a fair amount of time of him to be able to kind of keep trying to get this thing right. Um, I mean, Outman's been struggling too. Yeah. Uh, it's it, which is crazy because you don't even really feel it because the top of the lineup is so good. But I think they can survive it with how good the top of the lineup is, and I think they're going to give Taylor a little bit more run. But I think Vargas will be the first guy that that can get up and uh, make, make an impact for them and, and get a chance. Yeah, two guys to wrap that I know you're ready to kind of nerd out on. Oh yeah, first one is MJ Melendez of the Kansas City Royals, and Bobby Witt Jr. I mentioned has been playing like a top five player in the game this year. Bobby Witt Jr. has been utterly insane, and a lot of people want to talk about Salvador Perez really hitting. We just mentioned Nelson Velasquez really hitting. How about the duo at the top of that rotation in Cole Reagans and Brady Singer? They have been lethal. But MJ Melendez might be the best story out of all of it. And MJ had a negative 0.7 F4 in 2022 in 129 games. He played 148 games last year, and he had a 0.3 F4. He has doubled that mark in 14 games this year. And you can clearly point to the defense being average instead of literally the worst in baseball. Yeah. He's become a solid defender in a corner, which is amazing. And like Godspeed to him that that's awesome. But I know you really kind of want to geek out about the swing because he's hitting the shit out of the ball right now. Yeah. Well, and also it's just nice to see, I think it's important to know, like this guy was a catcher (laughs) and then they said, Hey, go out there in the outfield and he's a good athlete and tried to make it work, but it was, it was really rough last year. And that didn't happen in double A. Like that hardly happened in triple A either. He was catching for the most part in triple A. And then they realized the opening was in the corner of the big leagues. And they said, Hey man, go learn that at Kaufman. And he's finally gotten better at it. But I also think just catching sporadically, uh, wasn't great for the, the defensive value either because he was you know he was struggling back there. But swing wise, like there's some tangible differences, and it's ironically some similarities to Ivan Herrera that have me kind of buying into to what we're seeing here from MJ. And, I mean, remember this guy was the the home run king in 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 the minor leagues, and, and I mean was was absolutely mashing balls to both foul poles when when he was flying up through the minors and you know was a second round pick at one point and was extremely talented but if you look at the, the changes of the swing so 
His posture and his setup is a little bit different. He's more open. You see like the chest is kind of facing the pitcher a bit more and the hands naturally are a little bit more forward. And then, you know, we talk about Ivan Herrera, some more thing, then pulls the hands back. It looks like a lot, but it's the cue that these guys, some of these guys need. So then when he loads back and coils into his launch position, his hands aren't getting as deep behind him. And that was the thing that I think was kind of affecting him last year was he was starting more even. And then when he, he's a big, like, you know, coil inward guy, and he would coil in so far, but with the shoulders more than the lower half and the bat, if you look at like a side-by-side video wise, the bat would get almost wrapped around him and he would be turning with the shoulders instead of turning with the lower half. So now if you watch him, he starts a little bit more open, his hands are in front of him and he pulls his hands back, but instead of turning around and wrapping himself, he's coiling more with the lower half, not with the shoulders. Cause if you turn with the shoulders, you're just going to spin off when you're trying to get into that backside, you coil with the lower half. So you'll see him now coil more at the lower half, He's not getting as much like in those shoulders all the way turned around where you could literally see Melendez on his back, like facing the pitcher, which just think about that. You're going to get stuck. How are you going to be able to get out from that position when you're that rotated with your upper body and trying to use your lower body? So now he's able to kind of coil with the lower half, keep those shoulders more directional and not get stuck. And whenever I see that, then I go straight to the numbers and I'm like, okay, if the numbers also back it up, then I'm going to feel really confident that these changes, you know, are are pointing towards the success that we're seeing right now. And it's not just a, a fortunate stretch. Well, when you look at fastball numbers through his first 100 games last year, he hit 197 against heaters. I was able to kind of find from when he made that change. It was right around August, like a week into August. He hit 369 against fastballs after the rest of the season. And then so far this year, he hit 304. He's at 304 against fastballs. So, I feel like you can see the tangible adjustment. You're seeing the numbers now performing against fastballs. And I think it's really hard to deny what he's doing right now at the plate. I think this is a guy that found it, made some some adjustments, and is putting himself in position to be on time, handle velocity, and allow that swing to really play because it was it's a great swing. He just wasn't be able to get it off, you know, as as quickly, I think, as he he wanted to in the past and really be able to get the ball you know contact point out further and and it felt like he kind of looked rushed so the I want to go back to the point that you made when he was running into his issues during kind of his load he was almost turning his back right and you could read Melendez Melendez like you're saying um the only two guys that I really know that like have immense success doing that Otani and Otani he's even kind of like quieted that down and a Mm -hmm. young Harper too and yeah. those two have something in common. They're freaks of nature created in a lab. And they are like the elite rotators and body control guys that we've got in Major League Baseball. So you're saying, hey, normal human MJ Melendez, do the thing that Otani and Harper do. And it just doesn't work. And I could be mistaken on a young Harper, but if I if I remember correctly, that guy was like turning and just firing. And that's how that young of a guy got that elite of bat speed. But Otani, same deal. Like first couple of years in Anaheim, I mean, he was turning pretty much back to the pitcher and he was rotating and firing. And if you look at him now, though, even too, like it, it's not that full like turn backwards and his hands are a little bit more in, in a position where, you know, Otani kind of starts him there and leaves him there. Whereas if you look at Melendez, he was turning so much more with the shoulders, whereas Otani, it's it's more of that lower half turn. Melendez was turning so much with the shoulders that his bat was legitimately like almost like wrapped around him. So like, how are you going to get from wrapped around you and turned almost facing the umpire to unraveled and back and catching the ball, you know, where you need to catch it. Just, it was getting on him too quick by the time he wanted to launch, you know, go from the launch position to start moving forward. It was too long to get there. So you look at a guy like Otani, he starts preset, his hands don't get wrapped towards his body and, and, and behind him. And he's also just a freak of all freaks, but you see, he, he does it really well with the lower half. It's not really an upper body, you know, turn. And I, when you can see that adjustment and then you see the, the change in ability to handle velocity and you have the track record of him consistently elevating and driving the ball to all fields, I think you got to feel really good about what MJ Melendez is doing and, and kind of buy into the numbers that he's putting up. Um, I, I love seeing those adjustments and then seeing the, the numbers back it up. So for the people that were kind of moving MJ Melendez out of the conversation of the young Royals moving forward, and it was Bobby Witt, Vinny Pascantino and you know whoever else right the pitching 
yeah. you're saying factor MJ back into the equation long term. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely think so. Um, and look, is it going to look like this the whole year? I, I don't know. Like there's definitely still some whiff in there, but I think the ability to to handle the fastballs now, he's always had the adjustability, I think, against secondaries and stuff like his body works. He's very athletic. Uh, he, he gets some crazy swings off and still is able to produce damage. So I, I think he's a part of that core. And uh, I think just seeing that adjustment that he has made and seeing the way that he kind of finished last year and, and started to look better as well. Um, he he's a huge part of why I think they're out of the gate so well. And I, I think that this is going to be a young core. He's 25. Mm-hmm. Like he's still only 25 and now being more comfortable in the corner outfield. I think he's a piece for them. hundred percent. All right. Want to wrap with by ERA, one of the two best pitchers in baseball so far this year, Shota Imanaga with the Chicago Cubs, Imanaga and Paul Blackburn of the Oakland A's are your only two qualified starters right now <laughs> that have yet to allow an earned run. 0.00 ERA. Shota in his first three starts, 15 and a third, nine hits, one unearned run, has struck out 16 and walked two. So, Arm Layton, why is Shota Imanaga so freaking nasty out of the gate? Do you have anything you want to share before I just ramble for another minute? I don't think so. He's not walking anybody. I love watching the fastball and I love how fired up he's getting in his first couple of starts. That's my thing. He's pitching with emotion and it's controlled emotion, but a guy that's like 30 and you'd think super freaking measured and like, he's not missing the strike zone. You think he's going to be a cool customer at all times, but some of like the warrior cries that he's let out (laughs) at the end of innings, I'm like, he's becoming must watch TV for me every single time he's on the Hill. And I, you know, so we talked about it and I was saying how, you know, I am a little bit, worried about how, how he can limit the home runs. And this is relative. I think he's really good. And this is what we talked about in the initial report that we put together before he signed um, when I kind of tapped him as a guy that I think would be like a number three type, maybe even a little bit more than that. My concern was, you know, can he keep the ball in the yard when Wrigley's blowing out? And that'll still be something to monitor. But when I dove deeper into like the fastball quality, And then also dove into the fact that he's still kind of finding the splitter and slider. Like those are the pitches that, you know, when you make the move from the NPB ball to the major league ball, like those pitches are going to take a little bit more time. The splitter hasn't totally been there for him and the slider and curve, like he's barely thrown them. It's really just been pure fastball dominance. And when I look at the fastball now, it's everything that I thought it would be and maybe a little bit more. So I'll get nerdy here and I'll try to explain things. And Jack, you can like stop me if I, if there's like, if I'm too deep in the jargon and you think like listeners might just be like, what the hell is I'm talking about? But we talk about VAA a lot and it's the vertical approach angle of a fastball. And it's just the way that it appears to be coming out of the hand. And it's, it's measured by degrees and the closer to zero, the more that it's going to look like it is just taking off out of the hand. And we talk about induced vertical break. These, all all these things, you know, cross over and overlap in, in a lot of ways. And we'll get to that in a moment, but he has one of the flattest VAAs among all starters. And when I give you the names, like if you don't even totally understand how VAA works, I'll give you the names of the guys that are ahead of him. And then you'll be like, Oh, you can almost see it when you close your eyes. But the flat VAA is going to help the fastball play up at the top of the zone because naturally you get over the top of baseballs and they work downward with gravity. But when you can somehow allow it to kind of stay on plane out of your hand, it's going to play up a lot more. His VAA is 4.1 degrees. So the only guys ahead of him are that are qualified starters with at least 70 fastballs, Jerry Jones, Mm -hmm. Joe Ryan, Christian Javier, Freddie Peralta, Andrew Heaney, Kyle Harrison, Aaron Nola's four seamer, and Zach Wheeler. These are all these guys, four seamers. And he's tied with Zach Wheeler and with the 4.1 degree VAA. It's worth noting Wheeler gets another foot of extension. Peralta gets more extension. Jones gets more extension, but it's not like Imanaga is not getting any extension. He still gets right around average, but that grouping shows you what he's able to do with the fastball in terms of creating that flat approach angle. And that's why he's getting 38% chase on the fastball. It, guys are just not able to decipher whether it's a strike at the top of the zone or a ball, two balls up, that's going to stay up there. So the way that, you know, you can kind of see that. And I, and I bet a lot of people heard that grouping of names and they closed their eyes and they saw one of their deliveries and said, okay, yeah, that makes sense. The way that I can, you know, almost try and translate that is they're still overhead deliveries or three quarters deliveries, but they're so far down on the mound 
they're so deep in their legs that it's coming out from where like a side armor would be throwing in terms of just height off the mound. They're so deep in their lower half that they're just pretty much out in front. And that fastball is taking off like a rocket ship. You want to talk about fastballs taking off. That's what Imanaga's is doing. Yeah. And then you take it a step further. I think that's perfect. And also it's just the ability, just it's like almost a, just a, you can't teach it to a degree where the guys can just almost have the ball roll out of their hands a little bit differently where it's just going to stay on that trajectory. But in terms of induced vertical break, and this is just literally like when you see IVB, and I know that's become a huge buzzword, but it's literally just how, how many inches, you know, it is basically how much can you fight gravity with your fastball? So if you get 18 inches of induced vertical break, that means that your fastball is dropping like roughly 18 inches less than the generic fastball from that point, at least in that, per, in the perception. So like that is something that the higher the IVB, the more swings and misses you're going to get at the top of the zone as well, because hitters are expecting gravity to drop that ball more. And it doesn't, he is ninth among starting pitchers in IVB for his fastball, but there's another layer that makes it even more ridiculous. So he averages 18.7 inches of induced vertical break, which is ninth. It's the highest induced vertical break of any pitcher from a release height of 5.7 feet or below. Think about it like this. If, if you're trying to defy gravity from a fastball and you're trying to keep it higher, it's easier to induce vertical break from a higher release point because if you're starting lower, the fastball is starting lower. So it's naturally going to have less inches of induced vertical break to work with. So if it's naturally harder to induce vertical break from a lower release height, and he has a low release height, his release height's five point five feet, I believe yes. MLB average is 5.9. And he is in the top nine in IVB in all of major league baseball among starters. That's why his fastball is getting near 40% chase rate. And that's why his fastball will continue to dominate hitters. Some will clip him. They'll catch that, you know, that fastball and, and hit, hit a home run and backspin it. But that's why that pitch is going to play for him. And that's why he's already had success despite the splitter and breaking balls, not even really being there for him yet. So by the laws of physics, it is impossible for a baseball pitch to rise. Softball, you've got the rise ball, right? Because you're coming and you're almost releasing at like an upward trajectory. With baseball and an overhead delivery, it is impossible for an overhead delivery for a fastball to rise. But what you're saying is you create almost a scatter plot and you have release height and in an induced vertical break the farther you are higher on the induced vertical break and lower on the release height, the more and more it looks like it's a gravity defying pitch. Yes. So yes. you're saying that Shota Imanaga has the one fastball that looks like it could be as close to a rise ball as possible in major league baseball. Just about, you know, it becomes like a sliding scale thing. Cause then you have Christian Javier who releases from 5.8 feet, which is not that much more than Imanaga. You know, it's only about 0.2, like but he 20 gets 20, 20 inches of vert. So it's like, what's more important, a 0.2 feet lower of release or two more inches of IVB? Probably the two inches. I don't know. We need a larger know. sample, but it's really, it becomes a sliding scale. The point being though, is like, if you're going to be lower and you're still able to make, you know, lower release height wise, and you're still able to maintain elite IVB, like that's crazy. Guys that are releasing from like 5.2 feet, 5.3 feet, like a Joe Ryan, He's only getting like 14, you know, inches of induced vertical break. That's all you need you from shouldn't that. Be, you shouldn't yeah. be riding at 18, 19, 20 no. from that. Everything line. from that release height should, because you're going down from the side or you're literally getting so deep in your lower half, everything should be running horizontally. So to get any ride is crazy. So the, the, the science behind it is the lower you go with a, your release, the harder it is to create ride or that induced vertical break. Imanaga being low and creating ridiculous ride makes him a fastball that is not something that hitters are used to seeing. You add the fact that it's from the left side, and then it's even more rare. Think about all the names that I just mentioned. The only lefties were Heaney, Harrison, and Imanaga. Imanaga. So it's just a really special fastball. And as the splitter gets better and you know more comfortable for him, I think he's going to be taking care of business. Um, it'll be interesting to see how hitters, you know, try to bring him down a little bit, you know, and try not to chase at the top. Cause you know, as they start to see him more and more, they can start to adjust, but you know, I, I think you got to feel really good about what he's got going. And uh, if you have any questions about that, like I, I'll probably write like a, 
IVB pitch height, like that whole breakdown explainer. But that's why we were so high on Jared Jones and, you know, look at what he's doing already. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them in the YouTube comments. But I do, I do think we have one more thing we got to mention before we wrap up here. Yeah, uh, I just saw it too. Christina DeNicola just reported that Max Meyer was optioned to AAA Jacksonville. The one thing that the Miami Marlins had going for them this year, they just sent to the shrimp. He's going to be Griff's teammate. Is Griff excited to be uh, in the outfield for Max Meyer? That's pretty cool. I don't, I doubt it because. What a joke. What I a doubt, fucking joke. I doubt Griff's excited about that because he loves Max and he knows that Max is the ultimate competitor. And I can guarantee you that Max Meyer is not happy uh, to be going back to AAA. Um, it was really cool to see like that. He looked as good as I've seen him at any stop in that last outing. Led the the league so far of any any starter, 23 whiffs. Max Meyer has a changeup now. And that he was commanding the heck out of that changeup. That changes everything for me. Because the fastball has always been a concern for me. Velocity-wise, it's fine. But when you don't have a third pitch, it becomes concerning because the fastball quality isn't that good. But when you have an elite slider – you still throw hard enough, and now you've got a changeup that was looking like a plus pitch. I mean, he was dicing with that against you know good hitters. I mean, not only do you need that guy in the rotation, um, he looks like someone that could end up being you know one of their key guys. I understand that they don't want to burn Weathers' last option, and you know Weathers has one option left. Puck has two, and you're not going to option Rogers. Burn Puck, put Puck in the pen, do something. I, I agree. Option Birch Smith. I don't care and put puck in the pen. This is embarrassing. And uh, look, I'm sure that you can make some procedural argument as to why this makes sense with Edward Cabrera rejoining the rotation, Braxton Garrett, you know, set to rejoin the rotation pretty soon already made a rehab appearance as well, but I just don't care. Like you're, you're trying to survive the season and you're trying to fight off what has been like one of the worst starts in franchise history. And one of the worst starts in baseball history for a team that just made the playoffs. Like, come on. Max Meyer needs to be out there five days from his last start. Maybe they are able to sneak him back up and it's just a procedural move. But if it's not, it's utterly embarrassing. Even if, if it's one spot through one time through the rotation and Max Meyer is not in there, it's utterly embarrassing. I I don't know if they don't want to admit that the AJ puck experiment was, was silly. Um, And they're holding on to spring training looks and not the several starts that we've had where he is, really battled himself. Ryan Weathers, I think, is a fine back end arm, but after what you saw from Max Meyer, like I don't care about the options. Uh like I, again, I th- I think you could figure out a way to make this work. And it's extremely disappointing that they haven't. And it's just a tough look. And I'm sure Max Meyer is not happy about it because not only did he earn it, you know, I, I think he he you could have made the case that just he earned it before with his track record in the minors. And then, you know, should have gotten a longer look anyways. But now after what he did the last couple starts, it's it's borderline laughable uh, to, to not have Meyer back in the rotation the next time you go around. Only thing I got to add, not only is Max Meyer your Marlins leader in F4 at 0.3 at this point, he's one of two players that has been positive by war. Jazz Chisholm's at 0.1. Everybody else is at zero or negative. Max yeah. Meyer has literally been their best player. And say what you want about pitcher wins. Like I agree. They're not an important. Yeah, stat, but when you but... win two games and he's got two, of, he's got both yeah. or whatever. Yeah. You've they've won three games and he has two of them. There you go. Like that's all you got to know. So uh, again, I, I, hopefully he just comes back up and they're like, Oh, you know, we didn't mind burning one of Meyer's options because everybody else, you know, would, it would have hurt more to burn the options. And he's back up literally th- the second he's due to start again, then I can, you know, understand it. But if he's not up in time for his next start, I think it's a complete joke. So like, Lavalette, I, Jace Lavalette, like who are they tanking for right now? Lavalette's in holiday. Yeah. Ethan Holiday is a 2025 guy. Yeah. So Holiday so, yeah. Pro- Holiday is probably going one. It's a lottery, but... dude. Like that, you know they're gonna get the fourth pick. Right. So you either go and get Holiday, Lavalette, Ethan Petrie from South Carolina, Canarella from Clemson. Like, come on. <laughs> like, like this is so stupid. So <laughs> stupid. So yeah, hope uh hope that pissed you guys off. Um, that's what we got going today. 
Go get your merch uh, and all that jazz. Go listen to every other show on the Just Baseball Network. We're putting out great stuff. Just fantasy guys are pumping out excellent content. Uh-huh. And um, that's it for yeah. me. You got anything? Uh, Clubhouse chatter. Uh, mm-hmm. Just great stuff from Kevin Henry. He's been getting a lot of really cool, just like sit down, quick conversations. It's just a really fun and easy and digestible listen. Uh, check that out. I mean, he he was talking to F1 about his pitch mix for 15 minutes. He's talked to you know all, all these different pitchers or, or hitters or whatever. And it's just quick 15 minutes, get some insight that you're just not normally going to get. And um, I just think it's a really cool way to kind of start your day and, and hear from directly from a big league pitcher, you know, or, or hitter getting into the nitty gritty. Uh, and then NBA playoffs are starting. So check out our friends at the just basketball show. They're doing great stuff over there. And um pumped to kind of see how the heat can disappoint me this year, but they've been keeping me up. They've been keeping me up with everything because I you know, just haven't had the bandwidth to keep up with basketball. So it's been great to just have that just basketball show kind of in my ears every week. And and those guys do an awesome job. I know you, uh, you heard that Joel Anthony made the just baseball show. Yes. I heard that that's electric. I can't believe you did that without me. It was, I mean, it was just the Dodger thing. Like Peter was trying to say that they've been underwhelming. I'm like, dude, look at the front five. Like, why did we like the 2011, 2012 Miami heat? It wasn't because of Joel Anthony and Mario Chalmers. Yeah, that's fair. Let's stop doing that. So that's fair. Yeah. That was, that was the take, but we will talk to you guys. It'll be Aram and Peter with a mailbag tomorrow.